Yeah, let's just jump into the topic. So today we're talking about, is there a need for tandem transplants in today's myeloma? A tandem autologous transplant means that two autologous stem cell transplants are performed within six months of each other and have been used in the past for those, especially with high risk multiple myeloma. But considering all of the new immunotherapies that are coming up, the question is beginning to be asked, is there still a role for tandem transplants in today's treatment um, paradigm? I think that's the right use of that word. And um, not saying that tonight we're going to have all of the answers, but I definitely thought that it was something worth our time to look into. And Dr. Riesel graciously accepted the challenge of talking about this and giving us more information on the subject. It is now my pleasure to introduce him to you. He's the director of the myeloma program um, at Georgetown University Hospital and professor of medicine at Georgetown University. Concurrently, he's also the co-director of the myeloma division and director of myeloma research at John Thurow Cancer Center at Hackensack University. Previously, he was the director of the BMT program at Loyola University and an attending physician at St. Vincent's Comprehensive Cancer Center and professor of medicine and clinical director of the blood and marrow transplant program at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. He has a lot of experience, many publications in myeloma, is a key player in myeloma research, and we're just really excited to have you here, Dr. Riesel, to be able to share your expertise and knowledge with us tonight. So with that being said, I'll turn the time over to you and we can get started. Thanks, Audrey. It's very flattering, way beyond what I probably deserve. But I, <laughs> want to thank, I want to thank you. I want to thank Health Tree. I want to thank the sponsors for having this program and my hope that I can educate the attendees in, in some little way about transplant myeloma tandem transplants, what the future may hold. And uh, I, I really think this is a great opportunity for everyone. So let me share my screen and get my presentation. All right. Um, I hope everyone, Audrey, can everyone see that? Can yes, see that? looks great. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, as, as Audrey mentioned, I'm, I'm a hybrid. I've actually been doing myeloma and transplants for over 30 years. My picture probably doesn't do me uh, service because I think I'm a lot greater than I was in that picture, which is not that new. Um, but I've had the opportunity to be involved, particularly in tandem transplants, since 1990, when I spent six years as faculty at Arkansas. Arkansas was the pioneer in tandem transplants. And it took off from there to various places in Europe. Um, and still a pertinent question today. Now, this is not going to be an all-encompassing talk. I really wanted to reserve a lot of time to answer questions. And there's a lot of unknown answers to the questions you're going to ask me. CAR T cells, not CAR T cells, bispecifics, yes, no bispecifics, autotransplants going to get replaced by CAR T cells or bispecifics. A lot of this is, is, is just unknown at this point in time, and I'll be completely honest with you. So I, again, was able to be one of the, in the group that started doing tandem transplants. We did it on essentially everybody that was transplant eligible. One thing you need to know when you talk about tandem transplants, I want to make something completely clear to begin with. Medicare, the average age of myeloma is 70. Medicare will only pay for a single transplant. Let me repeat that. Medicare will only pay for a single transplant. For those of you who say, after you listen to my talk, you say, well, maybe I would consider a tandem transplant. I'll pay for it myself. Depends where you go, but I think it's in the 125 to 150 grand range if, if you had to pay for it yourself. So up until about 2000, Medicare didn't pay for one transplant, let alone two. So when we talk about tandem transplants, it's basically for people that have private insurance. That being said, I just saw anecdotally, one of my patients is on initial therapy. She turns 65 in July. So we're trying to rush to get her transplant in before she turns 65, because after she turns 65, again, Medicare will pay for one transplant, she'd be eligible to have another transplant. 
So private carriers, often a lot of them will pay for two, depends on a lot of clinical variables, Medicare one. So single versus double. When we, when I was in Arkansas, everyone got two transplants. Well, that doesn't really tell you is two better than one. So we're going back, this is ancient history. First of all, transplant in 1990 and in 2023 is still considered the standard of care for newly diagnosed patients who are eligible for transplant. Audrey said there's already been a session on basic single transplant, step, who's eligible, stem cell collection, and a single transplant. So I'm not going to go over that in any detail. Um, I will tell you that, again, I'm a transplanter doctor and a myeloma doctor. And we, my senior partner and I, both used to be in Arkansas. So we will transplant patients up to the, if they're in reasonably good shape, up to the age of 80. Almost all centers will transplant up to age 70. Many centers will transplant at 75. After over 75, not so many. But standard of care is a single transplant for transplant eligible patients. The eligibility is a, a little bit subjective, but that's been the standard of care since the early 1990s when the French did a trial. The name of the trial was the IFM 90. They looked at transplant versus no transplant, transplant one. We're going to address if one is good, is two better? So the basis for doing this as a historical perspective is my mentor, you, if you will. Again, I was faculty at the time. It wasn't like I was in training. I was faculty, part of the staff. My mentor, Dr. Bart Barlagi, had come from <clears throat> MD Anderson Hospital in Houston. And before he went to myeloma, he was actually a leukemia doctor. Well, in leukemia, just as, a, as an aside of how we got from, should we do two? In leukemia, patients get initial therapy, then they get consolidation therapy. So you get an initial induction therapy, and then depending on the individual, you may get two to four months, or I should two to four cycles of additional therapy. One treatment itself does not cure leukemia. If you get consolidation therapy or additional therapy, a percentage of those patients are cured. Well, he took that philosophy that two is better than one, and we applied it to this, this um, regimen that we call total therapy one, that was conducted between 1990 and 1996. And we showed fantastic results that two transplants appeared to be superior, but we didn't compare it to one. So that it's a little bit of a flaw in the design, but we proved the principle, yes, you could collect enough cells. Yes, you could do it safely. And, and yes, we think, we thought that the outcomes were gonna be superior of doing two transplants versus one transplant. Well, so the French, again, the French often trump us in the US on a number of trials. I'm not gonna show you a French trial today. I don't think I can show you an Italian trial and a US trial. Um, the French did a trial of two transplants versus one in newly diagnosed patients. And what they found, again, this is in the 1990s. That trial was called the IFM 94. We're talking 30 years ago. We didn't have Revlimid, we didn't have Velcade, we didn't have Darzalex, we didn't have Pomelis, we didn't have bispecifics, we didn't have CAR T cells, we had very limited therapies. But looking at those drugs and what they did in 1994, they did one versus two, and they found that the patients who did not get a very good partial remission were the ones who benefited from a second transplant. We're going to get into the issue of high risk in a little bit. This is historical perspective. Two was better than one. If you didn't get a very good partial remission, I need to tell you the gradation of responses in myeloma. So if you start off with the bad protein, the M protein, the myeloma protein, the monoclonal protein, the SPEP, whatever you want to call it, let's just say it's four. If you get to two or less, that's called a partial remission. A 50% improvement is a partial remission. If you get to 90% improvement, so if it goes from 4 to 0.4, that's called a VGPR or a very good partial remission. So the group that had the best response to two transplants were those that had less than a 90% improvement in their myeloma parameters. Don't want to go into a little bit later, we're going to talk about complete remissions and possibly even about MRD, minimal residual disease. So 2 beat one for those that didn't get a VGPR, for those that had a VGPR, the second transplant didn't really help. 
So at that time, we said that two is better than one if you didn't get a good response, and that now we can actually say that those patients who have high risk side genetics, two appears to be better than one, and that's the data that I want to share with you. So these are the historical data. The IFM94 is the one I just told you about, two versus one. There was another trial done in Sweden that showed that if you got a complete response with two transplants, you did better than if you had a complete response with one transplant. But there was an Italian study and another French study that, that did not show two is better than one. So some said yes, some said no. So we're gonna jump forward about 20 years and we're gonna talk about a US trial. We're gonna show a US trial and we're gonna show a, I'm gonna show you a European trial that was led by one of the Italian investigators. The US trial looked at three arms, large trial, 750 patients in the trial. And in this trial, they got whatever initial therapy, induction therapy that was up to the individual investigator. And then there was a randomization, a computer picked, whether you got one transplant followed by maintenance, one transplant followed by consolidation, which was usually the same regimen they got initially, followed by maintenance, or two transplants followed by maintenance. So they're comparing one to two, and an intermediate group was the group that got two to two to three cycles of, excuse me, four cycles of consolidation, and everyone on that trial got maintenance. Everyone used the same recipe for transplant, the same recipe we've been using since the late 18, uh, 1980s. Everyone's been using Melphalan, which is the drug we use for transplant. So this is a very large trial. It was published a number of years ago, and bottom line was when they looked at PFS's the remission rate, how long you stay in remission, when they looked at the initial data at 38 months. So at 38 months, they said, okay, what's everyone doing now that it's 38 months since they're, they had their first transplant? Well, they looked at the two transplants, the one transplant with consolidation, one transplant with maintenance. And when you look at these curves, they're essentially on top of each other. There was no difference in how long they stayed in remission, and there was no difference in how long the patients lived between those three arms. Well, I'm one of the authors on this trial. We were actually very disappointed because we thought, sure, that two would be one, and one plus consolidation would be one without consolidation. Didn't happen. That was at 38 months. We subsequently looked at a six-year follow-up, not three, three years, two, two months, but six-year follow-up. Results came out, uh, I'm going to get back to that slide. The results came out a little bit different. For those patients who had standard risk disease, the curves were again exactly the same. But when they looked at the patients who had high risk disease, high risk disease, they found that the double transplant was superior than the single transplant. So here's the double transplant in the green. This is the high risk group. Um, my pointer doesn't work out. My mouse doesn't work to build. So this is five years, 53% of the patients were still in remission. If you had two transplants, only 42% if you had one transplant. So this was overall about the same for the groups. This is the, excuse me, this is the standard risk group. This is the high risk group. It was 43 months for the, it's essentially the same. Standard risk um, was 58 months versus 43 months. High risk patients, even if they had two transplants, didn't do as well as a standard risk. But when they looked at maintenance, it was, a year longer remission duration in the high risk group and almost a year longer in the standard risk group when they looked at this for longer term follow up. A side question, which we're gonna, I'm going to show a little bit data later, is what do you do after transplant? Standard of care based on a number of trials is for Revlimid maintenance. Well, in the US, we were giving Revlimid until patients either couldn't tolerate it or they relapsed, the disease came back. In France, they decided, well, we only need to give it for one year, they do just as well. Well, when we looked at the data in this same US trial, those who continued 
the Revlimid or lenalidomide is the trade name for Revlimid, are those who stopped, the patients who stayed on Revlimid stayed in remission longer. So A, Revlimid was better than no Revlimid, and you should stay on the Revlimid until you progress. And I'm going to show you some more data about that in a little bit. So what they concluded, and this has not been published yet. We're, we're, I'm actually one of the co-authors on this manuscript. We're working on it. They found that there was a superior remission duration, double transplant, if you had high-risk disease. Second thing they concluded is you should stay on Revlimid maintenance therapy. Otherwise, you had a shorter remission. Well, the Europeans did a very complicated trial. If you think that was complicated because there's three arms, the European trial, which I'm going to show you the schema, is even more complicated. But they were asking the question again, two versus one, which is what the US trial looked at. So two versus one transplant. So in Europe, they used a, quite a bit different regimen. I don't want to focus on the different treatments, the different recipes that were used, but I want to do two things. One is they did transplant, part of the study was transplant versus no transplant, transplant one, okay? So that's the first lesson. They did consolidation versus no consolidation, for the most part, consolidation one. When they looked at single versus double transplants, I'm gonna show you the data, transplant twice, one. Large trial, 1,200 patients were on this trial. So this is the likelihood of being in remission at three years. If you had one transplant, the likelihood of being in remission at three years after the other therapies, 64% um, two transplants, 72%. What about the high-risk group? High-risk group had a much more significant benefit from two transplants, 44%. Again, high-risk group, even if you do two transplants, doesn't quite equal, although in this study, it came close, 64, or excuse me, 44% versus 64 for standard risk, but 44% that had one transplant, two transplants, 69%. It was a 25% improvement in the likelihood of being in remission at three years if you had two transplants. And this was statistically significant. And they looked at various risk factors, what your stage was, and the patients who had two transplants, if they had one uh, stage one versus stage two, three, which is a higher risk group, you did better if you had two transplants. Again, they looked at the standard risk versus the high risk groups. You did better if you had two transplants. When they looked at overall survival, not just how long it worked, the group that had two transplants had a significantly longer lifespan if you were having two transplants. When they looked at younger people, there really wasn't much different if you were under 55 and, and a minority of the patients are under 55. Again, the average age is 70. When they looked at older individuals, there was actually even a marked improvement in the likelihood of being alive at three years. It was 80% versus 90% if you had two transplants. So again, when they looked at the survival of the high risk versus standard risk, they found that the group that had the high risk had a higher likelihood of being alive at three years with two transplants than with one transplant. Now, that being said, you'd think, well, if two transplants is so great, what's the likelihood of improving your response? So even if you have two transplants, only a fourth of those patients who had two transplants actually improved their response rate. They stayed in remission longer, they lived longer, but the actual improvement response rate was rather, rather smaller than one would expect. So only 24% of the patients improved, 70% had no change, even though they had two transplants, and 5% actually progressed between one and two transplants. 
So the actual depth of response is as critical as the fact you had the second transplant that's still associated with an improved remission duration and as I showed you before, survival. So they concluded right here, patients with high risk site genetics were the ones most likely to benefit from two transplants. The likelihood for being in remission three years, 69% versus 44%. So they still, and many specialists still recommend that if you have high risk disease, you should consider having two transplants. Next topic, stop, I'm changing gears a little bit. I already alluded to this before. There's still this question. This is the most recent data just got presented last December on should you be on Revlimid? And if you should be on Revlimid for maintenance, how long? And does it work for high-risk patients versus standard-risk patients? There are four large trials that have been published before this trial, and it showed that Revlimid didn't really help the high-risk patients. This trial shows completely different data, and I'm going to show that to you in a second. So the first thing is there was a very complicated initial therapy followed by transplant, and then they got randomized to Revlimid or no Revlimid. This had been done multiple times dating back many years. What they found is Revlimid, the, the curve on top is the Revlimid, was superior as long as how long you stayed in remission um, versus no Revlimid. And all the other trials show that. And this is almost exactly the same data that was seen in a very large US trial. The lenalidomide group in the US trial was 57 months, and the group without the Revlimid was 30 months. So this was 64. So the likelihood of being in remission is essentially twice as long if you go on Revlimid. We're going to skip the other side of the slide. This is dividing between the standard risk and the high risk group. Revlimid versus observation. The group that didn't get Revlimid, again, the Revlimid group did superior standard risk. But look at the high risk group. Revlimid, this is the only trial that shows this, but it's a large trial. It's a large trial. And they showed that the Revlimid group, even if you had high risk disease, still did better than the no Revlimid group 38 months versus 21. And again, no matter how you cut it, even if you make their, their, their uh, progression longer, their lives longer, it still doesn't meet the standard risk. So here's standard risk, 64 months, high risk, 38 months. This is still the group, even if you put them on Revlimid, this is still the group that we need to do a lot of work on, which is the high risk group. So two transplants, Revlimid maintenance may be the route to go to give the best chance to have the longest survival. So I want to talk about MRD negativity. So uh, let's get back to response rate. So I told you if you have a 50% improvement in that bad protein when it's four and you go to two or less, 50% makes you a partial remission. If you go from four to 0.4, that's 90%, you're in a very good partial remission. If you go from four to zero and you do a bone marrow and the bone marrow doesn't show anything, you're in a complete remission. So that's like getting an A on the test. So you're in a complete remission, you got 100% on the test. We now have technology either using a test called flow cytometry or a test called next generation sequencing, which is genetic testing, to look, to look and see if you made 150 points on the 100 point test. If you make 150 points on the 100 point test, we call you MRD or minimal, resi minimal residual disease negative. So the group that gets MRD negative, they got 150 points on the test. They are still superior than the Rev if they're they're still superior if you had Revlimid, but the the difference isn't that good. So if you're MRD negative, even if you don't get maintenance therapy, it's still not not quite as good. But it's not 60 months versus 30 months. It's 60 months versus 45 months. So MRD negativity, even in the setting of no Revlimid maintenance is still a, a desirable level of disease control. And when they look at MRD positive, the MRD positive group, if you got Revlimid, did far better than the group that were MRD positive that did not get Revlimid. So Revlimid works 
whether you're MRD positive or negative. Although if you're MRD negative and you get and you're in the observation group, you do pretty well, but still not quite as well as if you go on the maintenance therapy. So the next question I want to deal with, which I told you about in the US trial, I said, do you stay on Revlimid beyond 38 months? You do better than if you stop Revlimid. So they actually did a longer term follow-up than that, than the US trial. They looked at three, four, and five years. And the longer you stayed on Revlimid, the, you still had the superior outcome versus no Revlimid. So their conclusion from that trial was, do not stop Revlimid. And that's what it says here. Continuing Revlimid maintenance for more than three years benefited the patients, even if they had MRD negativity. So that is a definite thing. Down the road, one of the, a new trial that recently came out was when they did MRD negativity serially. So you do it three months after transplant and you do it a year after transplant. If you continue to be MRD negative, you might be able to stop therapy. Might be. There's one trial in the US that's been published that says once you hit MRD negativity and it's sustained, you might be able to quit maintenance therapy. And I think I'm going to stop there, Audrey, and open the floor to questions. This is this gets into, I don't know if we have anybody who's actively being treated. The current regimen, the standard regimen for newly diagnosed patients is generally VRD, Velcade, Revlimid, Dex. There's new data been published that four drugs, one using the monoclonal antibody, Darzalex, plus VRD is superior to VRD. That's not part of what we're discussing today of one versus two transplants, but that is a more potent regimen to get four drugs versus three, and it's going and it leads to higher likelihood of getting MRD negative. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Dr. Diesel. Take it from there. Perfect. You did an excellent job. I would write down a question and then you would answer it on your next slide. I'd be like, oh, what's the PFS versus OS? And then the next slide was OS. And um, anyway, really, really great information shared with us today. Thank you. I think it's really important to get um, myeloma specialists who have been in the game for a long time and understand the history, understand where it has been and where it's going. I think it's um, interesting to hear, as you know, myeloma specialists differing opinions across the nation. Um, but thank you very much for, <clears throat> for sharing your information. And to my audience, right. feel free to enter into your enter in your questions in the Q and A. Um, you can click on that Q and A icon and then type your question. And I see a couple coming in here. One of the questions that I got before this meeting, um, Dr. Vesel, for you is. Does the burden of disease play a role in whether or not you would recommend a patient for a single versus tandem transplant? That's a great question. So in general, we covered, first of all, you're, you're right. You can get 20 myeloma experts and you probably get 35 opinions. Yeah. Um, and trust me, I'm biased. I've already admitted I'm one of the, I'm a transplanter as well as a myeloma doctor. I believe the data I showed you, I believe in. But there's some people would say, nope, one transplant, consolidation, maintenance therapy, you're done. Even though if they look at the data, this is, that's their opinion. The data supports two different large trials support it. But some people think they know better than large trials. So they're, they're weighing their opinion over data-generated uh, outcomes. So um, the question you asked was about... Burden of disease. Does the burden, burden of, of disease. disease? So the answer to that is, I believe in giving it to high risk patients. High risk patients are not, in my mind, not just defined by the genetic makeup of their myeloma. Um, I think it has to do somewhat with the burden of the disease as well. Those that have very high, you know, you come in with. We, I just made up a somebody who had an M protein of four, but someone comes in with ten or twelve, which must just be like brimming with. Oh, oh, with myeloma, those patients that have um, myeloma tumors, which we call plasma cytomas, 
have a poorer outcome. Um, and younger patients uh, actually have a better outcome than older patients because they're younger, but I tend to be more aggressive in younger patients that, that doesn't fall into the data I presented. So none of those were included in that, that data I presented. If you're asking me what I personally do, very young patients, uh, patients with high tumor burden, and those patients that have what we call macrofocal disease or plasma cytomas, I recommend that they get two transplants. Awesome, thank you. Um, Quinbin's wondering, what is the biology of better outcome for double stem cell transplant, cleaner stem cell collections? So one advantage you have of me being uh, more mature and doing this for a while, that I've been through all this stuff from almost the very beginning of doing stem cell transplants for myeloma, where we actually did bone marrow transplants and mm -hmm. didn't start doing stem cell transplants to the mid nineties. Um, the issue with cleaning up stem cells has been addressed and it's been addressed over 25 years ago where there was a chemotherapy drug they would take and they, at that time they were doing bone marrow transplants. They would add the chemotherapy drug to the, to the bone marrow, and they try to kill all the bad guys, give that bone marrow back to people, and they say, well, the bone marrow was cleaner. Yeah, it didn't grow very well, and it didn't help much. Then they came up with a, a less um, intensive therapy that they could clean up the, the stem cells by 99.999%. 99.999%, and there was a large trial that was looking at cleaned up stem cells versus uncleaned up stem cells. And the outcomes as far as remission durations were exactly the same. Oh, wow. Cleaning up the stem cells didn't work. No one does it anymore. And that's from the 1990s. However, we can now, in a sense, clean up the stem cells much better just because our initial, again, we didn't have all those drugs then. We didn't have Velcade, Rubmid, Darzalex. So we didn't get the degree of disease burden control that we can do now. And now we can probably have, just because we give more potent drugs, some of the patients go into transplant in complete remission. So they probably don't have very many circulating myeloma cells in the collections. But no, we don't do any exogenous treatment to treat the stem cells. But we do do what we call in vivo purging, in a sense, which is doing it just with the drugs and it cleans the body out way better than we ever used to do. But no, we do not try to clean up the stem cells. There's probably some myeloma cells in every, almost everyone's product. So talk to me about biologically what's happening with the two versus one. Is it just getting the immune system to, you know, as low as it can go so that it can grow again? What's do you understand what I'm asking? Like, what's so it, the it's, it's doing? probably not the immune system that's doing that. We're what we're doing is myeloma cells like to hide. You know, there's mm -hmm. like tall grass, and you're looking out over the plain, and you're going like, "Oh my God! All I see grass. I don't see what's down below." So it starts off with it on top of the grass. You see all these buds or something like that of flowers. You cut them off with the first go, but there's still some hidden. Right. Second transplant is to try to eradicate the ones we really don't see. Even when you don't, even if you don't see any, we still know they're there. Otherwise, we'd be curing the disease. Right. So right. we know there's residual myeloma. And again, it's the same concept: getting consolidation. It could be in complete remission, and yet we're giving them more drugs. Why? Because we know they're there. Mm -hmm. We give maintenance therapy to keep them in the ground so they don't flower and show up. Very well said, very well said, very well explained. Now, the next question, and I hear this all the time, patients are very hesitant regarding the intensity of the procedure, the side effects of the procedure, the time that you're gonna need to take off work. I mean, it's a big deal to choose to go through a stem cell transplant. How do you convince your patients to go through two of them when it comes to the side effect risks, just the risks in general of, of having a stem cell transplant, let alone two? So the toxicities and risks are not the same thing. Toxicities are temporary. There's very few 
I won't say none. There's very few long-term side effects from the blast of melphalan that we, the chemotherapy drug we get for the transplant. Won't say never going to be doing this 30 years. The risk though is very minimal. The risk when you, to me, a risk is what's the chance of dying? The chance of dying for somebody under the age of 70 is less than one in 200. So there, since there's very few long-term sequelae and almost no, I'm not going to say no one dies. If it's one in 200, somebody's going to be that one. But there's almost no deaths from it. So there's benefit and the risk to me, which is the chance of dying is very minimal. So it's not zero, but it, it's really very small. So the benefit outweighs the risk. To me, that's a go for. And depending on the age, I usually use a rule of, of uh, decades. If you're, the transplant takes two weeks, 12 to 14 days to do the transplant. Depending on your age, 40 year olds take four weeks to get better, 50 year olds take five weeks to get better, 60 year olds get six weeks together, 80 year olds take eight weeks to get better, and they should get back close to where they were before the transplant. Now you can say, well, why do I want to do that? But it's the best therapy. The, the, the long-term sequelae are minimal. Someone's bound to ask me, what about getting secondary cancers or something like that? Different issue, it's small. It's not zero. I didn't say there was no, no long-term sequelae. I said there are very few. Very few. So to me, it's, it's a, it's a short-term downside for a long-term gain. Yeah, that makes sense. What about when you see do you see more complications on their first transplant or on their second one? Does that so make the sense? the complications are almost identical. As far, the risk chance of dying is essentially identical. Mm -hmm. It's still less than 1%. Most people actually do better for the second transplant for a few reasons. One is they haven't had any chemotherapy for three to six months. Mm -hmm. And they're in better physical condition because otherwise they, you know, they got, let's say they got the routine regimen, Velky, Robin, Dex, they got that, you know, every week for four months or six months, they're off drugs for three to six months, their bodies have recuperated, hair hasn't grown back all the way, but it's starting to grow back. Um, so that's the first thing. Second thing is psychologically, they know what to expect. Mm -hmm. And that's a big to do because they're scared to death when they go in the first time, you know, they get counseled about all these things that can happen to them. And now they know what can happen to them. And they also know when, you know, to, to react to something once they start having any symptoms to try to nip it in the bud sooner. Right. The third, the third issue is the caretakers and stuff know what to expect because they're also scared to death. What's going to happen to them in the hot? Are they going to die? How am I going to take care of them when they get home? They find out really they're not that they're not that debilitated. So all in all, 80% of the time, second transplant's easier. 20% of the time you're wrong. The chemotherapy, the first time didn't cause diarrhea, the second time, you know, they can't stop their bowels from going. It happens. But for the most part, the vast majority of people do better for the second one than the first one. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Lots of good questions here. So I'm trying to organize them here. One question, do you do another induction therapy before second transplant, which you kind of just answered there? Um, and then what if the first collection of stem cells has bacterial issues, can that be used in the second transplant? Yeah, so if they have bacterial issues and you wanna do a second transplant, you need to collect them again. It depends on what the bacteria is. I mean, some people get staph, you know, everyone has staph all over their body. Um, if it's simple staph, sometimes you give the cells, you give them an, just the antibiotic that covers the staph and you don't worry about it. But if you had a more serious infection, infection in the stem cell product, you'd have to collect it again. Yeah. Here, Annabelle is asking the anticipated question of, is there an increased risk in acquiring that second cancer? with two stem cell transplants versus one? No, there's there's not an increased risk. The risk is really related to going on Revlimid maintenance after the transplant. There's an interaction with Revlimid, the bone marrow microenvironment, which is a fancy way of saying the, the bone marrow soil and, and the chemotherapy drug melphalan that increases 
the risk of getting a second cancer. So bad news, what I'm gonna tell you now is not to scare anyone. Anybody that has a cancer, doesn't have to be myeloma, you can have lung cancer, you could have uh, breast cancer. Anyone that has a cancer is at slightly increased risk of getting a second cancer. It, it, whether it's a genetic thing, it's related to the treatment you got, but if you have one cancer, there's about a two to 3% chance you're gonna get another cancer if you don't do anything. It's just facts of life. If you go on Revlimid after you've had melphalan for transplant, that risk goes from two to 3% to four to 6%. So yes, there's an increase, and it could be breast cancer, it could be leukemia, it could be Hodgkin's lymphoma or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, it, it could be a number of different cancers, but there is an increased risk. So you could say, well, why should I do that? Why would I want to go on Revlimid increase the risk? And that, that's, that's why I showed you what's the length of the duration of remission. So it's 60 months versus 30 months for taking a three to 4% or three to 5% increased risk of getting a second cancer. Most of the patients say, I'm not going to be that three to 5% because no one ever thinks it's going to be them. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to stay in remission twice as long. I'll take the Revlimid. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a complicated game. <laughs> so this question here, let's talk a little bit about Revlimid maintenance. Um, this person here is preparing for their first stem, stem cell transplant. They had to go off of VRD because it wasn't working and has been switched to Pomalist. Is there a hope of being able to go back on to Revlimid post stem cell transplant? If the Revlimid really didn't work the first time, the answer is it's not going to work later. That being said, there, I, I personally, and I'm not trying to second guess their doctor, unless the disease, if, 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 when you say it didn't work, it could be one of three things. One, it's getting worse. Second is it, it stayed the same. Or the third is it just didn't get um, improve enough. And I don't know which happened to that individual. Right. I will tell you that if it just didn't get as good as they wanted, or if it stayed the same, they should have just transplanted the person and not given them any more therapy. There's data that shows you shouldn't give people additional lines of therapy if the transplant's the ultimate goal anyway. If the patient's actually getting worse on VRD or whatever regimen they are, which is really quite rare, it's less than 5%, would get worse on that regimen, then you probably should get additional therapy. But if it was the same or they just didn't get the response they wanted, should have just transplanted the patient. Yeah, the answer is got better, but not as good as they wanted. So that's something to advocate for yourself of you know, being considered for that transplant right away. Getting a second opinion is always helpful. Um, you can get those second opinions by telehealth. So I'm glad you're here and we can become educated together. Annabelle is also asking a question about Revlimid maintenance. Is there any data on adding Darzalex to the maintenance regimen versus Revlimid alone? So Annabelle's on top of things. I give her, my, give her credit. There are two large international trials of Revlimid versus Revlimid plus Darzalex. Neither one of them has read out, meaning they, we don't have the results yet. Guarantee that Darzalex and Revlimid is going to be Revlimid. Guarantee it's going to happen. It's probably will become the standard of care in a few years. Good luck trying to get an insurance company to pay for it now, though. If you say, oh, you know, I'm sure that two drugs is going to be one drug. I want to get it now. They're not going to pay for it. The other issue, so that's going to be considered standard of care two, three years from now. The trials are finished. They haven't matured enough to see the data. One of them just finished, I swear to God, on May 4th. Oh, well. Uh, so... <laughs> And the other one finished the one that was it's U.S. It's predominant U.S. with some European trial. That one's closed May fourth. There's a completely European trial that closed a while ago, but neither one of them read out yet. There is some more data of two drugs versus one drug. Um, a study that was done um, in Italy, where and it's very very complicated study. I just want to talk about the maintenance question. So they randomized patients to either Revlimid again one drug or Kyprolis and Revlimid. So Kyprolis is, for those that are on Velcade, it, it's, it's a cousin of Velcade. Unlike Velcade, which is an injection, Kyprolis is an IV. So they gave two drugs versus one drug, similar to what I just told you about Darzalex plus Rev versus Rev. This was Kyprolis Rev versus Rev 
and this has been published, Kaipola's RevArm 1 for both standard risk and high risk patients. So somebody, and I've actually started treating my high risk patients with the combination of the two, because I can get that paid for by insurance. Right, right. What about just using Darzalex alone? Do you see a case of using that as maintenance so therapy? You, you, you will not be able to get it paid for, I don't think. I mean, unless you've got some insurance company that doesn't really look at your records. Would you ever use it on a patient? No. Um, there's, there's, there, there, is, uh, there is a trial. <laughs> there is a trial that was done in Europe, mainly Italy again, called the Cassio, I don't, don't ask me where they come up with these trial names, called the Cassiopeia trial. Mm -hmm. Again, it was a very complicated trial. Um, very, very complicated trial. But they did a randomization to Darzalex to observation. Just Darzalex, one drug versus none. And the Darzalex arm beat the observation arm in some of the patients. Oh, but no. then, I, then I'd have to get I'd have to get you through the entire very complicated trial to tell you which group of patients it benefited. But yes, there is some evidence that Darzalex will work for maintenance therapy by itself. But again, it's not FDA approved. I don't think you'll get it covered in the US. Thank you. Um, here's a participant. They have a good question. Essentially, the question is, do you test? So let's talk about these tandem transplants. In between the two, do you test how well the first one did and then base your results of doing the second one on so how well? I, I will tell you, my senior partner, who's also been doing myeloma for 30 years, will may test, but he'd say, do it anyway, because he's absolutely convinced everyone needs two transplants. I like to be a little bit more objective than that. And I'm not saying I'm right. Um, if he was here, he'd say, yeah, right. But um, <laughs> I actually, for those patients that do not get a complete remission, or even those patients who... I think they're in complete remission. I sometimes do MRD testing on their bone marrows. And if they're MRD positive, which I showed you, MRD negative, the 150 points is really the goal of therapy if you can get there. For those patients who are MRD positive, I will do a second transplant, hoping that I can get them to be MRD negative because they do better than if right. they're not MRD negative. So I do use that to differentiate. None of my colleagues do it that way. But I like to do something objective than just say for my gut, well, I think you're going to do better. There's yeah. no data to support what I said. It's then coming out. This particular um, participant tonight was told they were in remission and didn't need a second one. I guess I would question, what do they mean by in remission? Do they mean complete response? Do they mean MRD negative? Because are you stringent complete response? It really depends on there's so many levels now of how myeloma can respond. It is. Correct? So I, I don't know what they did to prove to truly say you're in complete remission, you have to have a bone marrow. Yeah. In the not too distant future, because everyone on the call probably detests having bone marrows done. In the not too distant future, we're going to have liquid biopsies. There is technology to do liquid biopsies to look for MRD negativity, um, but it's not as sensitive as using the bone marrow. And the, the reason for that is you're dealing with, with much more dilute likelihood of having myeloma cells in the blood than you are in the bone marrow. So the test isn't quite as sensitive for doing blood, although it is available, but it's a, it's a difference of looking finding one myeloma cell in 100,000 versus one in a million. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's much more sensitive in the bone marrow than the blood. I, but you, I guess if you said, I refuse to have it, I want to be tested anyway, you will get some results. It's not going to be as accurate yeah. right now. The technology keeps improving. Very true. Um, Jan asks a good question of how does being non-secretory play into this and as well with 1Q gain? So non-secretory is a non-starter. Uh, they do the same as the secretory patients. It's not, it has nothing to do with the, with the outcomes of disease. There's a couple of publications. I've just got one just approved um, 
a real world study that I did with some of my European colleagues, but there was a large study from the transplant registry that I'm also one of the authors on that shows the non-secretory patients do the same as the secretory patients. So that that's not a differentiating thing. One okay. Q is a high risk feature. Do you determine, okay, I have a que- I have a follow-up question. One Q gain versus one Q amplification, because some say amplification is considered high risk where gain is not. So, the, so um, in English, for those that don't, don't aren't as learned. True, yeah, before, sorry. <laughs> everyone, everyone has two chromosome ones. Chromosomes are divided into two sections, a long arm and a short arm. The short arms called the P arm and the, and the long arms called Q. So everyone has a one P and a one Q, two, two one P's and one Q's because there's two chromosome ones. What we're talking about is two different things. One, if you have three, so everyone has two one Q's, that's normal. Everyone has two one P's, that's normal. Some of the patient's myeloma cells have three one Qs, that's called a gain. That's bad. Some people have more than three one Qs, that's called amplification, that's really bad. So no, one Q gain is still not good, one Q amplifications is even worse. And on top of that, there are people that are missing one of their one Ps also don't do well. So, so if you have problems with chromosome one, whether it's the short arm, the P arm, or the long arm versus the Q arm, if you have too few of the P's or too many of the Q's, minding your P's and Q's, it's not a good thing. And you would recommend them then for the tandem transplant being high one, risk? The one P's is, isn't as definitive. I, I think that group probably should as well. The one Q's, yes, whether it's a gain or an amplification. Thank you. Brenda's wondering here, can you get T cells from the frozen stem cells? That is a fantastic question that we keep hounding the companies that make CAR T cells to to try to do this. There's no reason with technologies that they can't separate out the T cells from the stem cell product. No one's doing it right now. Right now, there's a problem just getting enough car, enough car T cell manufacturing slots, let alone to be playing with the products. I imagine down the road, and we have one group that's got that we're really trying to convince to to take the frozen stem cells and isolate out the T cells. We've got one group that we think are going to do this, so we can do a quick trial and see if it works. Awesome, encouraging. <laughs> Um, and then let's finish with this question. Back to those liquid biopsies. Do you see them eventually being used routinely in clinic versus the um, bone marrow biopsy? I think that everyone's probably, because we're sticklers for some tradition, I think that everyone's going to require at least one bone marrow because you don't sell, you do not diagnose myeloma without bio, uh, pathological proof. Right. I'm not sure, and it's based on the percentage of the myeloma cells in the bone marrow. I'm not sure that maybe way down the road, I don't see that happening anytime soon, that we're going to say, well, we'll just check your blood. And if you have myeloma in your cells in your blood, you have myeloma. I don't think we're going to buy into that for quite a period of time. I think you're still stuck no matter what with getting a bone marrow initially, because that's where the money's at. Later on, for the purpose of MRD negativity, I think that, and whether you're in complete remission, I think that's a possibility, but not initial diagnosis, not yet, not for a while. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Wiesel. That was very educating. I learned quite a bit during this session. I appreciate you. Is there anything you'd like to finish with tonight before we let you go? Well, I just want to, I want to give you a a quick thank you again to Audrey and and the sponsors and, and, uh, health three, but I just want to tell you that, yeah, I know I'm old. Yeah, I know I've been doing this a long time and I don't want to harp on that, but I want to tell you the good news. Two things, good news. One is when I first started doing myeloma in 1990, the average survival was two and a half years, two and a half years. Average survival now for someone with stage one disease that have standard risk side genetics, probably 15, 20 years or more. The other one I want to I read to you 
a text message I got from my sister-in-law two days ago. My sister-in-law lives in Florida in the winter, if I can find it. Um, where is it? I don't want to take up all your time. Oh, you're fine. Um, this is from my sister-in-law. She's writing me. There's a couple in my building that are former patients, my former patients. Mary Jones had a transplant 25 years ago. She's yeah. still in remission. To this day, she thanks the day that she met you and your team to get her through this many years of life. Oh, that's so touching. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. 25. Yep. That's amazing. That's amazing. Well, thank you. I mean, it goes without saying that we too are grateful for all the work that you are doing and continue to do in myeloma. And thank you for being willing to volunteer your time tonight and speak to us. I really do appreciate you. Thank my you, Dr. Pleasure. My pleasure. We'll be in touch. Bye now. Okay, to my audience, I'll just finish up with a couple of outro announcements and then we can finish up for tonight. I hope you learned as much as I did. That was fascinating. Tandem transplants is something that we definitely don't discuss as often. We're usually focused on immunotherapies and these novel agents and things like that. These tandem transplants are a big backbone of myeloma therapy. And it's really exciting for me to be able to learn more about them and learn what their role is still in myeloma and the success that the data is showing us in terms of responses, not only progression-free survival, but overall survival. And we hope to continue to see that as these continue to be published and investigated. Meet again with us in July. We're going to be discussing preparing mental health for stem cell transplant. That's pre, during, and post as I said earlier in the meeting, deciding to go through a stem cell transplant is probably one of the biggest decisions that you'll make in your life. And it really does change the outcome of your myeloma. I don't want to scare anybody. In today's myeloma, not getting a stem cell transplant is not an end of the road decision, but it could be right for you. And so that plays a role on your mental health. And going through an intense procedure plays a role on your mental health and not being able to do as much as you'd like for a period of time after the stem cell transplant plays a role as well. So I want to bring to you a discussion of how we can improve or prepare our mental stability and wellness during the stem cell transplant procedure. Um, other upcoming events that you may be interested in. We have our event tomorrow. We have two actually. One is our kidney chapter. We're going to be talking about how to interpret your myeloma labs if you have kidney disease or involvement when it comes to myeloma. Then that night is our Northeast chapter. So if you live anywhere from Maine to Pennsylvania, you're welcome to join us as we discuss the whole picture of healthy living. And then on the 16th at 1 p.m. Eastern is our health tree for multiple myeloma chapter. We're going to be talking about the health tree coach program that's completely free and provides one-on-one -on -one connections between myeloma patients and caregiver, like patients and caregivers or whoever you want to match with um, who can benefit you on your myeloma journey. The link to sign up for that event and even those events is found at the bottom of this slide. Another thank you to our sponsors, Amgen Abbey, Adaptive Biotechnologies, Janssen, Genentech, and BMS. And thank you to each of you for taking your time to be here with me tonight. I truly appreciate you. Hope you have a great rest of your night, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.